I wrote the Pandemic Design Diary back in April 2020, when the world was turned upside down by the coronavirus. It seemed to many people that our lives were falling apart, but it occurred to me that this crisis was an opportunity to rethink some of the assumptions that have been wrongly made about how to plan cities. And I identified seven kinds of design opportunity to rethink the way we plan everything from cities to building interiors. So let me briefly review them and consider the degree to which they've been acted on or not. I first suggested that traffic speeds should be reduced to 30 kilometres an hour to discourage speeding on emptier streets during lockdown and to keep the air clean, the sound low and the accident rates down after the return to work. I'm pleased to say that the UK government acted swiftly with policy and funding to encourage towns and cities to implement projects that encouraged walking and driving. Among these was a project I've helped to create for a 30 kilometre an hour speed limit across the town of Faversham with a population of 20,000 people. This has now been in place for over a year and is the first case of an entire town in England being covered by a 30 kilometre per hour limit. We now know from surveys that vehicle speeds have reduced across the town and that local people support these changes. And contrary to some thinking, lower speed limits do not always lead to longer journeys because slower traffic often moves more efficiently through busy junctions. Now, Faversham's been a success, but there haven't been enough similar towns and villages making these sorts of changes, and so the problem persists. Further funding is coming forward, and change is therefore happening, so I'm confident it will eventually be in place across all of the United Kingdom, as it is increasingly being implemented across the world, it's just a question of how quickly. So my overall takeaway is that the most successful projects were the ones that were already being planned before the coronavirus pandemic. My advice, therefore, is to anticipate the next crisis. Don't just wait for it to happen. My second design rec recommendation was to widen footways to improve physical distancing in the short term and then to encourage greater pedestrian flows in the long term. In addition to this, I recommended that roadways be narrowed to provide cycle lanes and to support physical activity during lockdown and to encourage active commuting on the return to work. And we saw this happening all over the world, from New York to London and from Berlin to Sydney to Auckland. It certainly helped to widen footways in the short term because that gave people confidence that there was more overall room for them to walk in. And new bike lanes have given people an alternative to using the bus or the subway. But sadly, some of this infrastructure was then removed when infection rates fell. Some administrations went back to their old ways of doing things. On the other hand, cities like Paris have used the coronavirus epidemic to accelerate the move that was already underway towards walking and cycling, putting in extensive bike lanes and now creating a city-wide speed limit of 30 kilometres an hour. My third recommendation was to provide more shade, more seats and more Wi-Fi in public spaces. 
furthermore, to place more seats on the widened footways I just mentioned, to provide opportunities for people to answer phone calls, to do work and to socialise outdoors where there is better ventilation than indoors. And this is some, certainly something that we've seen happen with the space between buildings becoming increasingly normal for business meetings. And I think we'll see much more of it in the future because people have realised now that it may not only be safer to be outside, but it may also be much more pleasurable. The office of the future is outside the building as well as inside it. My fourth recommendation was for shopkeepers to focus on customer experience, to have more space for interacting with the objects that customers are thinking of buying, as well as for them to be physically distant from each other, to have more space, for example, to try on clothing and more staff to support customer interactions more space to let people make calls and do work. In other words, to have more hybrid work, leisure experiences. And then to have less space for stock, for storage, because increasingly storage is happening off-site. And in addition, delivery can be done directly from warehouse to house without people having to carry purchases along with them. To date, I don't think we've seen this happen as much as I might have anticipated because I think shops are still recovering from being closed, being opened, being closed again. And then when they are open, they're perhaps still using their, their old business models. My expectation is that the shift will continue to be gradual as new technologies come along. That, for example, will make it easier to try on clothes using augmented and virtual realities. In offices, my fifth recommendation is certainly one where we have seen significant change in the last two years. And this was to improve the design of office spaces, knowing that with people working from home and enjoying all the comforts of home working, including technology that is often better than that found at work, then the office and the design of offices needs to step up to compete with working from home. As part of this, I suggested that designers focus on creating space for informal interaction and for team-based activities rather than individual working. Because since so many meetings have moved to the cloud, to online, most solo task-based activities can be done outside or from home. I encourage designers to question every square centimetre of their designs so that everywhere space in the office can serve at least two functions and so that any surplus space might then be sublet to other organisations. I recommended that businesses even encourage staff members to bring in their dogs and cats in order to recreate the seemingly informal random distractions that are now often occurring at home. We've become used to these interruptions and many people have even found that they help with their alertness, with their creativity and with their online relations with other people. My sixth recommendation was focused on the home, and this was to create webcam-friendly backdrops and microphone-friendly soft surfaces, not only for lockdown, but for the long run, because home is now an office and it's now a broadcast studio. It's also a school. It's a gym. And I suggested that these features should be designed into new homes and used as selling features because purchasers will expect them. And we can now see this happening in almost every sales brochure I look at for new homes. Our apartments and houses are being sold not only as places of shelter, 
with our families, but as proper workplaces. Finally, my seventh design recommendation was that places should be provided everywhere, in buildings and in public space, where people can be online with others. Places where they can be simultaneously spatial and transpatial. And we're definitely seeing this, especially in offices where small pods are now normal. Small rooms where people can go online for meetings that were not at all common two years ago. We're also seeing this in public space. People participating in often multi-person online meetings where you can see from their phone screens that they're in a work meeting even though they may be sat in the park. We've therefore seen many new human behaviours being provoked by the coronavirus and we've seen a variety of new, sometimes sophisticated responses being made by designers to meet people's basic needs. These basic needs are to be with others, to learn from them, to surprise each other by discovering new ideas and to create together to form the future. And so I'm increasingly confident that, as I predicted when I wrote the Pandemic Design Diary in April 2020, we will not go back. People will only continue to adapt to new ways of living. And therefore, our roles as urban planners, architects and interior designers will continue to be to observe, to react, to experiment, to assess, to respond and to innovate. And that if we do so, we will then be properly supporting patterns of thriving life in our buildings and in our cities.